Lunis and Yzelda are attempting to hire some support. They have posted notices in conspicuous places, stating the positions open and who is offering such employment. The weekly cost of this method is from 100 to 600 gold pieces. It will cost them 100 gold pieces, so that's 50 gold pieces each. I must determine the probability of the success of the attempt based upon the generosity of the offer made. Therefore, Yzelda and Lunis must make an offer to the potential hirelings to tempt them into service. The minimum is 100 gold pieces. The characters will offer 200 gold pieces to each hireling to tempt them. The extra gold pieces offered will increase the chance of attracting dwarves. The characters also note in their advertisement the opportunity for magical items, which is not a stretch considering what they have come across so far within the strange tower of Cadia. The characters are seeking a small band of men-at-arms and two more able adventurers to join them in their quest. First, I will make some rolls to determine the men-at-arms. Humans will be common, and elves and dwarves not so common. The characters are looking for either light footmen, heavy footmen, archers or crossbowmen. There will be a 75% chance of the hireling being human and a 25% chance of a demi-human. This is taking into account the offer of extra money to tempt the dwarves and the magical items to tempt the elves. I will make another simple roll to determine how many men-at-arms the characters attract, taking into account the numbers they are seeking, which will be between three and six. The characters receive interest from five men-at-arms made up of four humans, which includes one light foot, one heavy foot and two archers, as well as a heavy foot dwarf. The initial investment will be 1,000 gold pieces, and then a further 19 gold pieces every 29th day of the month. The loyalty of the men-at-arms must be determined by rolling 3d6 and referring to the loyalty chart given in the Men and Magic rulebook. The men-at-arms will be fairly loyal and will have a plus one on their morale dice. It will be a further 400 gold pieces for the initial investment of two adventurer types. These characters will equally share treasure obtained and will act as normal characters. To determine the type of adventurers the party attracts, I will roll to determine their ability scores at random and choose the most suitable class based on those scores. Character 1. Strength. 5. Intelligence. 9. Wisdom. 8. Constitution. 8. Dexterity. 7. Charisma. 15. This character will make a very charismatic but average magic user who is physically quite weak, but they will have to do. This magic user is male. His name is Varion. He is of lawful alignment. He starts the game with five hit points and purchases the following equipment for the adventure. A dagger, a leather backpack, water skin, a week of iron rations, six torches, five garlic buds, a large sack, as well as a draft horse with a saddle bag and a saddle. He has 83 gold pieces remaining. He also has the charm person spell memorized. 
Character 2. Strength. 14. Intelligence. 7. Wisdom. 8. Constitution. 12. Dexterity. 12. Charisma. 14. This character will make a suitable fighter, halfling or dwarf. I will rule here that the characters receive an offer from one of the halfling refugees to come into their service and earn some much needed coin and improve their circumstances. Halflings are limited to the lawful alignment. This character is also male. His name is Tanrin. As a fighter, he will get one plus one hit points. Six hit points. Tanrin purchases the following equipment for the adventure. A sword, a light crossbow with a case of 30 quarrels, chainmail armor, a leather backpack, a water skin, six torches, a week of standard rations, a large sack and five garlic buds. Tanrin also bought a draft horse with a saddle and saddle bags. He has 31 gold pieces remaining. With all preparations now made, the party heads southwest towards Cadian. With draft horses, they can now travel up to five hexes per day. However, as they will need to cross rough badlands and shrubland with mostly no trail or road to follow, it will take four out of five movement points to make it back to Cadian. The party will keep the following marching order. The dwarf heavy footman will go up front, followed closely by Lunis and Varley. To the left and right of these front ranks, there will be an archer on each side. Yazalda and Varian will hold the middle rank with Yazalda taking care of mapping duties. Tanrin and the light footman are next in line, followed by a heavy footman at the rear guard. The party camp in the scrubland outside Cadian when nightfall arrives. An encounter will take place. Nobody is surprised. The party hears the distant sound of howling wolves throughout the scrubland. As time passes, the howling seems to draw nearer to the camp. At this point, the party prepares themselves for a possible invasion of the camp, readying weapons, armour and lighting torches. And after some time passes, the party can just about make out a large pack of animals about 160 yards from the camp, silhouetted by the moonlight. To their horror, the party realises these are not just wolves, they are much bigger much more human-like in posture and proportion. There are 12 werewolves in what appears to be several large family packs led by larger adults and young of varying stages of growth. Without silver or magical weapons, the party cannot hope to defeat the werewolves and are in grave danger. Stay tuned to find out what happens next. If you'd like to know more about how I run my solo games, please visit solodungeoncrawler.blogspot.com or follow me on Twitter at crawlersolo. The party will need to evade the werewolves and only have a 50% chance to do so. 
The werewolves are far too quick for the party, who are barely able to mount their horses on time, and so are unable to evade successfully before they are pursued. The party flees as fast as they can, riding for their life, southwest towards the outskirts of Terusia. On horseback, the party is just a little faster than the werewolves, and so are not caught. The party continues riding southwest at speed, avoiding Terusia. They continue until they reach more open scrubland. They can still hear the distant howls of their pursuers. They are still being chased. This time, the party turns southeast, where they enter a forest on the edge of the River Bayanon. As the party is in the woods, their chance of evasion is now at 75%. The party successfully manages to evade the werewolves. The howls become progressively more distant, until the night air becomes still once again. For each hex moved in pursuit, a party must spend one half day resting. Therefore, the party must spend one and a half days of rest in the woods before they are able to continue their journey. During a day at rest, two dice are thrown for determining if wandering monsters are encountered, rather than one. The party is lost in the woods. As they are resting and dozing by their camp, they suddenly see dark shapes moving close. The party clamber to attention, surprised, and as they noisily ready themselves, the shapes now lurking in the camp also seem surprised. As the situation is brought into focus, the party are facing 12 weir tigers who have stalked into the camp. Attempting to catch the party unaware, the creatures are startled by the party's reaction. The weir tigers appear to be made up of several family packs, just like the werewolves were. There are four adults, two pairs of larger males and females, and two packs of young. Only silver weapons or magical weapons can affect them. The party has a 75% chance to evade. While the creatures are startled and uncertain, the party swiftly mount and evade. They must now decide which direction they will travel. They ride along the river to the north and out of the forest, and eventually the river opens out into Lake Luenon, which they follow along its shore until they reach Cadian around midnight on the second day of Equos, and there they rest until dawn. The night passes without incident, and the party enters the abandoned village once again. As the party walks through the abandoned village, they light torches to create fire and smoke and each character has a string of five garlic buds wrapped around their neck. Hopefully, this will deter any swarms of locusts from attack. The party passes through some of the old stone foundations as they make their way towards the lake. Inside the foundations, they recognise the remains of a large blacksmith's forge. Somewhere to the southwest, the buzzing of insects can be heard. The characters also notice a chipped stoneware bottle discarded on the floor. The buzzing of insects is getting louder. It sounds as though a locust swarm is heading their way. Lunis dismounts his horse and ducks into the remains of the forge and waves the others to do the same. The rest of the characters dismount too and clamber in as best they can, remaining crouched, still holding their burning torches aloft. This leaves the draft horses exposed. I will rule that there is a two in three chance the locusts will attack the draft horses. The swarm descends on one of the exposed horses, 
The party will try to force them away with their torches. There is a chance that they can surprise the swarm. The swarm is not taken by surprise as the characters fly towards it with torches waving. Initiative rolls. Party 4. Swarm 6. The swarm engulfs the draft horse, beginning to work aggressively on the flesh. The draft horse has an armor class of 7. 26 locusts are attacking the horse. I'm not even going to roll. It's pretty much a given that this horse will be devoured. It was Varley's horse. Now she no longer has one. The characters cut the distance with their torches. I will roll a morale check for the swarm to see if it can be forced away. I will rule that the swarm needs a score of 10 to remain in this instance. The swarm is broken by the heat and the flames and the heavy scent of garlic. It takes to the skies again disappears from sight as the sound of the buzzing dies away somewhere towards the northeast. Yazelda inspects the stoneware pot. It's full of salt, probably once used in the blacksmithing process. Yazelda takes the salt. It may come in handy. The party needs to keep moving. They travel south towards the jetty. Varley and Lunis will share a horse. It takes about 500 feet of movement to reach the jetty. It will take them about three turns. As the characters approach the jetty, they see a small Tarusian ship docked on the shore. There is only one person standing on the deck, an Awadan magic user wearing an identifying long yellow robe with embroidered sleeves displaying the pointed hexagon sitting against a chequered square. This woman has a crooked posture and a long dark braid. It appears the rest of the crew have been eaten alive by locusts. Their corpses are heaped and strewn about the shore with barely a scrap of flesh remaining. The Uarden magic user on deck looks startled as she holds a burning torch tightly afraid that the locusts will return any moment. Significantly outnumbered, she should be no real threat to the party who will attempt to subdue her. Varian, being the most charismatic, will handle the conversation. Why are you here? He asks to begin with. Will the locusts return and devour the party, consuming every piece of flesh from their bones? Will Varian be able to subdue the Uarden magic user? Or does the magic user have something up her sleeve? Find out next time. If you enjoy my content and would like to send a small donation to show your appreciation and help support this channel so it can continue to grow and expand, then please visit PayPal dot me forward slash tom d and d in this episode i'd like to thank john hayne david zacker and aaron anderson for their kind donations across may and june thanks so much if you enjoyed this episode then please give this video a like feel free to add a comment to let me know your thoughts if you don't want to miss a future video, then make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to receive a notification when I upload a new one. See you next session.